Welcome to Brain and Events. It's not very often that you get to see Jason and I sitting next to each other. We like to do this so that you realize that we actually live in the same city. And we are very delighted to have Eric Sampson come back on the show. We talked about the nature of morality last time, and now we're going to be talking about more of an applied topic. We're going to be talking about gun control. Eric, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Sure. Imagine you're sitting peacefully at home in your comfortable recliner, reading the latest novel by Jason Werbeloff, when all of a sudden your neighbor, with whom you've had multiple heated encounters, and who is way bigger and stronger than you, kicks down your door, baseball bat in hand, and says, hi there, I'm here to murder you. Now you find this troubling, but you're prepared, so you reach into the side pocket of your chair where you keep your gun, and with which you could easily defend yourself, only to find that it's not there. Instead, there's only a knife. You see, though I know that you think you need a gun, to defend yourself, I was worried that you might use the gun on yourself or someone else, even though I've never met you in my life and have no idea what motivated you to get the gun in the first place. So just days before this home invasion, I took the gun out of your house, sold it, and deposited the proceeds into your bank account. But don't be too upset. I was nice enough not to leave you entirely defenseless. I still left you that knife. Anyway, to finish the story, you do your best to defend yourself, but in the end, the guy murders you. Have I done something wrong here? It was a good novel, firstly. The- <laughs> it was excellent. That's why I was like so engrossed and I didn't see the home invasion. <laughs> okay, so presumably this is meant to be an argument uh, for the state not controlling our, our gun control because it seems like in this situation at least something bad has happened, right? I, I want access to the gun. Okay, so, so just uh, by the way, I actually don't have a defined position on this. I know that might sound convenient given how controversial the topic is, but I, ge- I genuinely don't have a strong position on this other way. The argument that might be put forward by the person who thinks that st- the state should be able to control guns is perhaps you cherry picking the case, right? So yes, in this situation, it seems like something terrible has happened. The state shouldn't have taken away my weapon. It doesn't matter that I have more money in my bank account. It doesn't matter that I have the, the, the knife. I'm still in trouble unless I'm like a MacGyver type person, I'm in, I'm in trouble. But what about other cases? So what about if we push other cases? What if we push cases of uh, children finding guns uh, and shooting their siblings by mistake or a toddler killing himself by mistake or sight gun stats, you're more likely to be involved in a home shooting if you own a gun and, and that home shooting is often more accidental than not. So, so what if we cherry picked a different case and and really embellish the story. And there's another one of my novels involved. And so <laughs> then, then our intuition is just going to sway the other way. Yeah, good. So you might think, well, look, it's true that maybe we violated your right. So typically the a reaction that a lot of people have to this case is, look, it's true that what's bad, this is bad. And what's bad about it is that I violated your rights. That is, you have a right to defend yourself against unjust attack. I prevented you. It's not just that I failed to aid you. It's that I actively prevented you from defending yourself against unjust attack. Michael Humer sometimes uh, says it's like if somebody comes to murder you and I hold you down while they actively stab you. It's not just that I failed to aid you. I actively stopped you from defending yourself. But what you might say is, okay, true, rights violation for sure. But just if you just saw all the good stuff we're going to get by violating rights, you would just be in awe of it. And the kinds of things you might say is, yeah, I mean, think about all the kids who accidentally shoot themselves or mass shootings or something like that. I mean, the thing to say about those particular cases is that accidental deaths in Amer- in America, at least, are, are about 1% of all gun deaths in the United States. So they're very, they're very rare. And the same with mass shootings. The number of people who die in mass shootings are less than uh, 1% of all gun deaths in America. So they sort of command our attention because of the media. They, they're very flashy in some ways in a really bad way, actually. But they're actually not what the main problem is. It's all sorts of other problems. But, but I take your point, which is like, well, isn't it like good? Isn't, aren't the consequences enough to override any sort of rights violation concerns that we have? And the standard thing to say from guns rights advocates is, well, that's sort of like rough, runs roughshod over the point of rights. So it's basically saying like, yeah, if we have to convict a few people unjustly because we want to prevent a right, like we should just unjustly prevent them and hang them because we're going to get great consequences. There's lots of other people we're not going to. So it basically just says, yeah, we're willing to break a few eggs if it makes a really nice omelet. And the thought is, that's not what gun, that's not what rights do. So you basically have to go full on into a um, into a consequential justification. And the concern is, if you like consequential justifications about gun rights, you should do it about all sorts of social policies, and that's going to lead you into lots of you know terrible things. At least that's what the gun rights advocates want to say. So if we take a rights approach, I suppose there's different ways we can cash out the right. The one is that you have a right to self defense, and the other one might be that you have a right to property. And I suppose the question then becomes. Can we reasonably restrict your right to own certain kinds of property? So let's say I say, look, 
I'm not actually that worried about uh, someone in my neighborhood breaking into my house. I'm more worried about someone in the neighboring state. Uh, let's say I live in Ukraine and those Russians look like they're, they're kind of getting a little close to my border. And I don't think it's efficient for me just to have a handgun under my pillow. And that's not really going to stop the invading hordes. I'd like something a little meaner than that. And so I say, I'd like a tank. And my neighbor says, yeah, tanks are right. But it'd be quite nice to have your own jet. And there's a lot of wealthy people in Ukraine. We can crowdfund, we can have some jets. And someone else says, oh, it would be really great, would be a nuke. The Russians have nukes. I want my own personal nuke. And I want to be able to take these guys out. Now, if you stop me from having any of these items, you're restricting my personal property rights. Now, I'm trying to give a case where we actually might think that intuitions lead us in the direction of saying, well, we do have a full-scale war in that neck of the woods. And it would be quite nice if people were able to defend themselves on aggressor, but we can see the risk of giving private citizens uh, heavy artillery and nukes. Good. Yeah. So how are we going to limit the right? Suppose we grant that you have a right to this thing. How are we going to limit it? The standard thing that gun right advocates say is, well, the purpose of allowing you to have private gun ownership is so you can defend yourself. And so the reason you can't have a nuke is because it's not necessary for, for defense against uh, unjust attack. If the concern is an invading military, well, there's a military for that sort of thing. That's what's going to prevent you uh, from being, you know, invaded by other countries to the extent that that you can be. And also, the other thing is that nuclear weapons and uh, bombs and tanks are indiscriminate. That is, they kill not only the attacker but anybody who's in the vicinity. And so that's going to be a reason to just to to prevent you from owning those things. What you need is something that's going to be effective for the purposes of self defense, and that's something like a handgun uh, or just the typical kinds of guns you see in America. So that's the way to limit the right. And then in terms of, well, what about property rights? Well, some people think, look, if you, if you can't operate the property that you have responsibly, for instance, if you have a history of using this thing very badly, then we're going to restrict your property rights. For instance, if you have multiple DUIs, well, then you can't drive a car. And if you, sh you have a criminal background, even guns rights advocates are, are happy to say, if you have violent crimes on your, on your history, then you can't have the right to a gun. It's not because you don't have a right to own property. It's just that you forfeit the right to have this, this kind of property because you've shown that you can't be responsible with it. So what do you do in the case of machine guns or automatic weapons? Now, if you've drawn the line at self-defense, it's more difficult sometimes to substantiate the idea that an automatic weapon is necessary for self-defense. I have heard arguments raised, for example, certain people live uh, where there's wild boar and there'll be like 30 of them that come onto your land or 50 of them or 100 that run through and, and really a handgun's gonna do nothing. You need to have automatic weapons. But let's put those cases aside. So there's no wild boar around, you, you live in New York, and now should you be able to own an automatic weapon? Good, yeah, this is a disagreement even among gun right advocates, like how far do we want to extend this? Some people are happy to say, yes, you should be able to have an automatic weapon. And why is that? Well, because two reasons. One, if multiple people come after you, and sometimes they do, especially in a city, if you're like, if you're worried about the rival gang members coming to get you, or you're worried about your ex-husband and his friends coming over to you know, do bad things to you, then you're going to need more than just a standard handgun. So some people say, yeah, we're happy to do that. And furthermore, uh, automatic weapons are helpful for preventing uh, unjust attack from the state. So tyranny, or if you are someplace like Ukraine and your, and your military just isn't going to successfully defend you, then you might need an automatic weapon yourself to defend yourself. Now, a lot of gun control advocates think that it's just a fantasy to think that you could stop the U.S. government from harming you in various ways or your government, whoever they are, because they're almost certainly going to have tanks and nuclear weapons and all sorts of things. And if they want to destroy you, they easily can destroy you. But the thing to say, so a lot of people just sort of laugh at the suggestion that you would need a 100-round magazine or an automatic weapon to defend yourself from the state. But what gun right advocates say is, look, we're not suggesting that we need this, this, these huge magazines or these automatic weapons because we're going to destroy the U.S. military. Instead, we're just going to make it very costly for them to oppress us such that they stop doing it or they, it's not worth it for them to do it. In other words, we're going to raise the cost significantly so that they won't do it in the first place. It's not as though we think that once they fully commit, we're going to destroy them. Of course we're not. They're going to destroy us if they fully commit, but we're going to make it so that they won't fully commit. And this is, in fact, in the United States, I mean, this is one reason I'm not the least bit worried about the U.S. government turning on the citizenry because there's so many guns in America, it just isn't going to work. And so I'm sort of less worried about tyranny precisely because there are guns. So in South Africa, we had a week long violent riot about six months ago, which erupted in uh, vast parts of the country. About 200 shopping centers were burned to the ground. A lot of people were killed and 
it wasn't the case that we had a pernicious government that was attacking citizens. We had a government that was incapable of protecting citizens. So the only reason that all the shopping centers weren't burnt down was because you had groups of individuals with handguns, with semi-automatic guns, protecting storefronts for each other's sake, and eventually were able to to quell the riots. From what I understand, some of these towns, over 10,000 rounds were fired off, and an individual handgun would have been insufficient. And you really had the police and the army doing nothing, and uh, citizens sort of showing this is how you protect people. What's interesting to my mind as well is that the those that were burning things down and killing people didn't have guns. They used other cheap devices. Uh, it's quite easy to take some petrol and make a Molotov cocktail and throw it into, into a building so that you can burn it and loot it. And it might be quite difficult to get guns. And look, one of the concerns about guns is, and the sort of argument for criminalizing them, is that criminals are going to use guns and they're going to go and very efficiently kill innocent people. And the concern, the counterpoint is that if we outlaw guns, well, the outlaws are going to keep their guns because they don't really care about abiding by the law. So it's very, very difficult to drive those weapons out of their hands. It may be in a country like the UK, where there just isn't much gun ownership, that it becomes very, very hard for people to get access to guns. And the question is, in a society like that, should we reverse the order? Should we allow people to get guns to their heart's desire or should we maintain the status quo? Great. Yeah. So this is one place where the gun debate gets complicated because it's going to matter where you are and what the prevalence of guns is, what the dangers are. So in the United States, a lot of people look at the gun problem in the United States. And I think I'm happy to admit that there is a gun problem in the United States. And they're just like, why can't you guys just ban the guns? Like, what's the problem here? And the problem is that there's 400 million guns in the United States and there's 325 million people. So if you ban guns tomorrow, as you say, who's going to turn in their guns? It's going to be the law abiding citizens and who's going to keep their guns. It's going to be the non law abiding citizens. So the question isn't, would your society be better off if there were no guns? The answer is almost certainly yes. The question is what would happen if we institute gun laws? And the answer to that is the law abiders would turn in their guns and the law and the, the criminals would not. And now you're going to have an even worse situation than you previously had. But in some places like the UK where there aren't guns in the first place, or they're at least not very prevalent at all, then they have this question, which is, well, given what would happen if we institute gun bans, what would happen then? And if the answer is, well, no one would have any guns and we'd be significantly safer and we wouldn't be violating people's rights because they wouldn't have guns in the first place to be killed, then it may be that Britain should keep their gun laws as they are. So, for instance, if you asked me if I had a magic wand and I could just wave it and all the guns in the United States would completely go away in one, in one swoop, would I wave the wand? I probably would wave it. I think we'd be significantly better off. I think I'd be significantly better off. Would we violate people's rights? Probably not nearly as much as we would with gun laws. But the, the, the issue is there is no such wand because w when you institute a gun law, you don't take away all the guns. You take it from some people, the law abiders and not the, the criminals. And that's precisely the problem. So all that to say, it does get complicated and it depends on what the gun situation is in your particular jurisdiction. So the starting point is very important. But maybe one can mitigate against that issue. So yes, you can't wave a magic wand right now. And yes, if you were to suddenly implement gun control, it would take a long time for those guns to be handed in and some of them just wouldn't be handed in. But over time, there'll be fewer and fewer guns circulating within the country. So the argument will go, well, yes, today, if you implement gun control, there won't suddenly be an absence of guns in the country, but there'll be half, half the guns or a third of the guns. And over time, it'll become a quarter and an eighth. And, and over long stretches of time, there'll be almost none. So the idea is that yes, today we can't do it, but over time we can still implement that. And if you think that the situation is ideal where there are no guns, then shouldn't you be striving towards that? Yeah, if, if that were the solution, I would be like all for it. The, the, the trouble is that the thing about bans is that they don't just make things go away as we, as we well know with drugs. Uh, and alcohol, for instance, we've tried prohibition in the United States. It was an absolute disaster. People continued to produce alcohol. We banned guns in the United States. People continued to produce drugs. The thought is if we ban guns, it's not as though they're going to stop producing them. Of course, they're going to be stopped. They're going to stop being manufactured in large scale legal factories. But of course, people still know how to, how to make guns. So the, right now in the United States, you can put together things called ghost guns, where you basically buy the individual parts of each, of each part of the gun separately. They chip to your house. And then you put it together on your own and then you use the gun. There are people who uh, manufacture in their homes ammunition. So you might think, oh, well, we should just ban all ammunition. I like that idea. I think that's a cool idea. Unfortunately, people are still going to be using ammunition. And so 
the the worry is are you going to have for yourself another situation like the drug war where you're trying to ban this thing that just can't be stamped out because people know how to make it they want to make it there's always going to be a demand to make it and so they're just going to keep doing it as long as there are 400 million guns in the united states and these things don't disintegrate overnight they're around for 100 for at least 100 years people are going to still want guns so they're going to keep creating guns in response to the fact that there are all these guns already in the in the united states and those aren't going away anytime soon so the supply of guns is going to not diminish significantly over time. I wish it would, but the thought is that it's not. And also as 3D printers get better, so right now you can 3D print mostly a plastic gun, but presumably over time, the technology is gonna get better to where you can do it with metals and a uh, hard object. And maybe you even can, I mean, I haven't been keeping up with the latest 3D printing technology, but eventually that's gonna be the kind of thing that you just download the software to how to make a gun, you input the raw materials and then it just makes it for you. That's another thing that you have to worry about. If that's a situation that we're gonna get ourselves into, then a gun ban just isn't gonna be a significant help here. In fact, it's gonna do exactly the thing that we said before, which is take away the guns from the law compliers and leave it in the hands of the non-compliant. So one real life case, if we think about Australia, they had, I think it was a mass shooting which prompted them to have a massive gun buyback where civilians were encouraged to hand over their guns to the government, the guns would be destroyed and they'd be paid a certain amount of money. And I think that happened in about 1990. It was very unpopular at the time. The, the, the premier of Australia, I think, only got one term after that. But it's sort of lauded as this case where at the moment in Australia, there's a very, very few gun deaths. But what isn't talked about is that over the last 30 years, Australians went and they bought more guns and that they're the same number of guns uh, in Australia now as they were in 1990. I want to push back on something else, which is this notion that if we wave the magic wand and could remove all the guns, that would be a good thing. I think it might be a terrible thing. If you think about Rwanda, um, people weren't killed with guns. A million people were hacked to death with machetes. There are other ways to quite efficiently and brutally murder people. I would think that if you had uh, a minority of people who have been attacked with machetes, one of the things that might have saved them would have been some guns. And so it strikes me that if we think about the nature of human history, the trend has been towards reductions in violence over time. We live, and it's hard to sort of see it now while we're in the middle of a, what might be World War III, we live in a generally peaceful period in time. But before, before guns, you go back 200 years, you had enormous amounts of bloodshed. You had people killing each other with, with all sorts of weapons. And it might be that the kind of, effect of both sides having guns makes both sides say, well, there's a better way to resolve our conflict. Maybe we should talk so we don't all wind up dead. I like that suggestion. So about the the gun buyback, I mean, that's a cool idea. The, the trouble with doing it in America is just that one, you'd have to pay an enormous amount of money because to make it worth it for citizens to give their guns back. So you just have to pay an enormous amount. And as you buy more and more guns, those guns that are out there get more and more scarce, which means the price of them goes up and up and up. So you can't just pay one you know, flat price for all the guns that people just are not going to give them away under those conditions. So yeah, a lot of people in Australia are very proud of their, their take on guns, but they just there's a relevant difference between Australia and the United States, which is we have way more guns. So we have about 120 guns for every 100 per people in the United States. So more guns than people. Yeah, but your point about Rwanda is a good one. So when I said that I would wave the magic wand, gun advocates would be very upset with me about that, precisely for the reasons that you say. Many, re many of the reasons we want a gun is for self-defense and not merely from people who have a gun. It's from people who are bigger and stronger and more aggressive than we are and know how to fight and know how to beat us up or have are, are more organized and bring more buddies to the, to the killing than we have. And so, yeah, those are good reasons to also want to have guns. This is an argument I haven't seen explored that I've sort of uh, kicked around in my head for a little bit, which is like the unexpected value argument for having guns, which is like, yeah, maybe it's bad in the short term. Are we see like this sort of like boiling or like this steady kill, uh, amount of killings? But if it prevents enormous genocides or huge amounts of bloodshed every hundred years or so, or every fifty years, then it may be worth it to have a low level amount of of uh, gun deaths over the course of time. I haven't seen anybody explore that argument, but it seems basically right to me. So in the in the twentieth century, about twenty million people were killed by their own governments. And that doesn't even include invasions or murders or anything like that. I mean, just turning on their own people. So these also seem good reasons to have guns. Again, defenders or opponents of, of guns often say, well, that's just, a, again, like you're never going to defend yourself against, against uh, the government. But in Rwanda, for instance, they probably could have because they didn't have the sort of weapons that more militarized governments have. So I'm on board with you. Let me say something in defense of defenders of gun control, which is this, when you have that amount of guns in this society, what you get is a militarized police. 
That is a bunch of police who are in a society swimming with guns. And so every encounter that they have with people, they're sort of trigger happy because they never know if this person's going to pull a gun on them and shoot them. They also have to have bulletproof vests and they have to match the firepower of the citizenry, which means they have to have high capacity magazines. They have to have tanks and all sorts of things to sort of break into buildings with people who are strapped to their teeth with guns. And that makes the society less safer or less safe because they're significantly more militarized. They have SWAT teams and things like that. And that is something that the United States has and other countries don't have at least nearly as much. And that's a concern you might have, which is killing the, of the police. So if you're worried about the state turning on you, one of the things you could do is take away your guns, at least some people say, because the reason they're being re- aggressive towards you is because they're worried about the guns that you have. So one argument might be that in a, a gun-free society, not gun-free as in lack of guns, but free use of guns, that there's certain almost guaranteed deaths that you're, that you're assuming will happen if you allow people to, to own guns. So you're assuming there's going to be some mass shootings. You're assuming there's going to be armed robberies. You're assuming that there's going to be a militarized police that sometimes is too, too trigger happy. And you're kind of like sacrificing those victims to what you take to be a greater good, which is self-defense when it comes to home invasions. I'm assuming that's that's the majority of of the reason for why people say it's important to be able to own a gun. So what you're doing is you're sacrificing some to protect others. And some people might just be very uncomfortable with that. I mean, you're talking to a utilitarian here, so he's not so uncomfortable with that. I just look at the numbers. But a lot of people are not so comfortable with that. They see the the spectacle of a mass shooting and they say, we have to stop this from happening, right? And if you say to them, but hold on, look at the numbers that, you know, how many people were involved in that mass shooting? It wasn't that many compared with home invasions. They might still not be swayed, right? So they might say, well, the numbers don't really matter. What, what matters is we must stop this from happening. Some people do talk that way. They say, look, if you're not willing to stop the gun violence or to implement certain laws, then you're, you're just letting these people be slaughtered. And I mean, here, an old philosopher distinction is going to, you know, come in handy, which is the doing versus allowing distinction. So you might say, look, we're not sacrificing people. We're just not doing something that results in people's death. But the state isn't in getting involved and in killing these people. They're being killed by other people. Those are the people that you should be worried about rather than the state. But they're not the ones who are going in and killing people. So at least that's the, the first step. So then another thing is, it would be nice if uh, a gun ban would bring down the numbers. Unfortunately, we just don't have the empirical evidence that shows that if we did institute a gun ban, that the number of people killed would in fact bring down the number of deaths. Now, it might bring down the number of deaths total, but then if it ups the proportion of innocent people who are killed, that is people who were had their, you know, were going to defend themselves against gun violence and were prevented from doing so because of the gun laws, then you might think, okay, well, taking away all the guns may prevent some violent people who are, you know, in gangs or who are part of uh, drug cartels from them from being killed, but they're violent people. And the reason that they're being killed by guns is because they're shooting guns at other people with guns. So maybe we'll prevent their deaths, but you're going to lead to more deaths of people who are peaceful citizens who are just being killed by all these criminals who have guns and now know that the, that the law abiders don't have guns and they can be abused at their, at the will of people who have the guns because, they're defenseless because the, the government has made them so. So all that to say, I would, I would love it if uh, a gun ban would sort of significantly reduce the number of, of killings, but it just isn't clear that that's so. Another reason is because most people who commit murder in the United States already have a criminal record. That is, they were already the kinds of people who are inclined to commit uh, crimes, which means that they're not the kind of person who's going to be dissuaded from using and uh, obtaining a gun by a gun ban. So we've talked about counting numbers of lives lost and doing a certain kind of calculation. But there's something that you alluded to earlier, which is that there are certain kinds of killings that the public view differently. So if we think about school shootings, the idea that you could have at Sandy Hook, a whole bunch of very young children executed by a gunman, that creates a strong feeling in people that we should ban all weapons. Because if we can save one innocent child from dying, that's a good reason to do it. The other I gather that when we talk about gun deaths, there's an assumption that those deaths are as a result of homicide. But as far as I understand, I think about 25% of them in the States are suicide. We might again- It's actually higher. It's about, it's about two thirds are suicide. So that's another important uh, piece here, which is most gun deaths in the United States are the result of suicide. So they're mostly, there's about 40 gun deaths a year due to, uh, due to guns. And about two thirds of those are, are suicides, which means that roughly 12 to 14,000 of them are, are homicides. 
Yes. So I suppose one of the questions is how we should think of suicides. The one might be to say, well, it's a deep tragedy that people would kill themselves. It seems to be the case that if you take away someone's ability to kill themselves with one mechanism, they don't always just substitute. So for example, you have people who are walking down a bridge and might suddenly feel the sense of wanting to, to kill themselves and throw themselves off the bridge. And it turns out that if you put up a barricade and they're unable to throw themselves off, they don't go home and shoot themselves or you know gas themselves in their car or take poison. They just don't do it. And it might be that the nature of having a gun in your house, that if you're going through a particularly bad time, that you have a very quick, efficient way of killing yourself. Uh, and if you didn't have the gun around, that feeling would subside and you wouldn't do it. But we might also think that if you think about discovering someone in your family who shot themselves, that that's a particularly horrible, tragic thing. Uh, and the vividness of it might play a role in how we do the accounting. It also seems that America is an outlier on the mass shooting. So when I've looked at the numbers, it's you have other countries that have very high levels of penetration with regards to guns. The Germans, the Swiss, the Canadians have lots and lots of guns, but very, very few mass shootings. And there's something vivid about the idea of an active shooter walking around a school or a campus, or there was a shooter in Las Vegas who shot into a crowd and killed 55 people. So should we view these vivid accounts differently? Is it just a matter of calculating the numbers or thinking about it as rights, or do we say there are certain things um, that they're so horrific that we should do everything in our power to prevent them from happening? Yeah, good. So let's start with the suicide case. So it's true that uh, a lot of these deaths are suicides. It's true that these are often often impulsive decisions. So oftentimes when people report, people who've uh, tried but failed to commit suicide, they report having thought about it no more than 10 minutes, most of them report it's just sort of a thought that occurred to them. And then they went and got something to sort of begin to kill themselves. Now, of course, we can't pull people who in fact succeeded in, in killing themselves, but it does look like it's a very impulsive decision and guns sort of help with that. But at least what many gun advocates say is one, th I mean, one thing is at least when somebody commits suicide, it's not a rights violation in any obvious sense. So they're killing themselves, which is very sad. And of course we, but, but if what we're interested in is protecting rights, then we shouldn't stop other people from exercising their rights. Everybody is, is banned a gun because some people are going to use it to harm themselves, but doesn't violate anybody else's right. That's not a reason to use the coercive power of the government to do that. It's also a bad decision. And a lot of people like, for instance, Michael Humer will say it's not, it just isn't the government's job to use the coercive powers of the state to stop you from making an impulsive or a bad decision. A lot of people sign up for dead end jobs or get in tons of debt or in abusive relationships or to choose a terrible college major. These are all terrible decisions, decisions that could ruin your life. And it just isn't the government's job to break in and prevent you by means of coercion, especially by coercing lots of other people from taking those steps. So at least that's the standard thing to say to the, to the suicide case. Now, in terms of mass shootings, as I said, there are less than 1% of the number of deaths. And I guess, I think if you're coming at this from a utilitarian perspective, as many people who want to ban guns or at least significantly restrict guns are, then that just isn't going to be a good way to go because, as I say, most of them are going to be deaths of suicide or homicides with handguns rather than rifles. And they're just not going to be these sorts of mass shootings. That's just not the place to go. Now, as a political matter, now you might, you might want to go ahead and grab these, these big sort of dramatic cases and use them for the purposes of getting your, your political agenda achieved. Maybe that's sort of a savvy way of, of using them. But in terms of the calculations, it's not going to do a very good job. The other thing is that if you're, what you're worried about is rights violations, then again, because the thought is because some people are going to use their, this privilege terribly, but that's not a reason to coerce literally everyone in the society and prevent them from being able to defend themselves. So Eric, so far we've really discussed the morality of, of guns, right? So, or of gun control. So we've looked at utilitarianism and a rights-based system asking whether gun control would harm certain rights, would undermine certain rights, and would lead to the best outcomes. And I think you've made a good case for at least in a society where a gun control is absent or largely absent, you don't want to try and reverse it. But there's a different question which we might ask, and it's something I think Mark might be trying to get at, is an aesthetic question. So it's, 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 the question is not, well, Yes. If you say to the, to the parent at Sandy Hook and you say, well, you know, I, I'm really sorry about, about your child's death, but the fact that this person was able to buy a gun and perform this atrocious act actually is part of a system that ultimately results in fewer deaths. They, they might feel very upset. And part of why they might feel upset is because, well, do we want to live in the kind of society 
where that kind of mass shooting is possible. Now you might say, well, yes, we do, because we want to prevent a whole lot of individual deaths from happening, which would have happened without people being able to own guns. But aesthetically, it's, it's sort of like, which society aesthetically would you like to live in? Forget the numbers for a moment. It's like, would you prefer to live in the UK where there aren't these mass shootings? Or would you prefer to live in the US where there are? Aesthetically. Uh, yeah. How do you cash out what I mean by aesthetically? It's not easy to do. It's more like the feeling of it. It's, it's like, how does it feel to live in that kind of society? It sounds like the aesthetics of, of a gun-wielding society doesn't feel as good as the yeah. no. of a society without. Yeah, it's ugly. It mars the painting of the United States for sure. I mean, this is when philosophers are going to be annoying and say, well, look, I mean, yeah, the painting is uglier for having that sort of thing on the on the painting. If we had a tool that could get it off or we had some like eraser, we had something, we just had something to reach for and get it. We would do it in a second. Unfortunately, we don't because anything we reach for is just going to tear a big hole in the painting or at least make it worse in some other ways. So that's, of course, that's not a comforting thing to hear. You just want the spot to go away. But if we're just sort of trying to think about ways to, to fix the spot, we can all regret. I think, and I think gun advocates would want to do the same. They would say, absolutely, it, it makes the world and the United States worse for having that kind of thing in it. I mean, I, I guess I would say the same thing about lots of other institutions as well. So for instance, you might think that the the free or the capitalist system or the, the market, for instance, leads to all sorts of terrible events that if you look in isolation, looks terrible. And it's not pleasant to go to someone and say, I understand you lost your job because your business wasn't supplying the consumers with the goods that they want. And now you can't make a living. But you see, if you live in this society, as a matter of fact, I think that argument is right. And I think it's unfortunate and it's never good to hear. And similarly with the legal system, I understand that this person got off because the police didn't gather evidence correctly, or they planted some that was false, but the rest of it was good evidence and it showed that they're guilty, but they still got off. That's never good to hear like, but you see like it's part, it's part of a legal system where if we throw out that sort of case, then we're in much better, there's going to be less injustice. It's never good to hear that, but it's true. And unfortunately, philosophers are called to say what's true and not just what's, you know, pretty. And again, I want pretty, I want the, I want the United States to be beautiful. I, I don't want them to be marred by uh, mass shootings. Unfortunately, I don't know that there's a tool that we could do to fix the painting. Yeah, I think the power of what you're saying is you can't just look at this painting. You have to think about the alternative paintings that could be there. If you think about Winston Churchill's famous line about democracy, he says, it's the worst system except for all others. And you can tell me how horrid that painting of democracy is, how, how many stupid people get to vote and play a role and how many terrible things, how much corruption there is. But let's look at the alternative systems and let's see how much worse they are. If I think about a particularly horrible case in the UK, um, there's a film made about it called Boy A. It's these two kids who are about age of 11, kidnapped a two-year-old child, and they tied that child to train tracks, and the child was then killed by a train. That's a particularly vivid, ugly thing. The UK, in some ways, is marred through that. But it would be insane to think that we ought to ban trains, that we sort of say, this is a horrible thing, it takes a twisted mind to do it. If there were no trains, those kids would have found some other horrific way of killing that toddler. And I think this is the case sometimes with the kind of person who is going to commit cold acts of murder. It's not about the tool that they use. It's about their nature. And one way to sort of make our painting better, to respect the aesthetics and respect the moral considerations is to change the incentive structure. So you might think that, well, if you live in a society where you think you will get caught for the crimes that you commit, that might make a very big difference as to whether you want to commit those crimes. It turns out that increasing the penalty might not make too much of a difference. But if someone says, if I do this, I know I'm going to jail for 10 years, and that sounds pretty awful to me, I better not do it. The idea of, well, maybe I'll get caught, maybe I'll get the death penalty, but I think I'm lucky I'm willing to roll the dice. Different sort of state of affairs. Right, yeah. So, yeah, two things, uh, I mean, occurred to me there. One is that you mentioned that there are, we can tell an ugly story about virtually any sort of part of society. And I should say that the gun advocates could also tell their ugly stories as well. That is stories about people who have been the, who have been the, the victims of home invasions or who have been walking down the street when they were attacked by a gang or some ex-husband who came to kill the, the wife and the wife asked for the police to help and the police just weren't there in time. I mean, so for any sort of anecdote you tell about how terrible gun violence is, we can tell a story about how, how terrible violence is without done to people who don't have an opportunity to defend themselves. 
So that's one thing to say. The other thing about mass shootings is that uh, they're so difficult to predict. So again, like I agree that mass shootings are awful, but when you sort of look back at the stories, there's virtually no nothing in their past that will sort of tip you off that this person was going to commit a, a mass shooting. Now, in some cases, there's like a note that you, I guess it's possible you could have found. But in terms of just their psychological disposition, they're often ha- they often have things that tons of people have. They're depressed. They don't have many friends. They have been uh, down on their luck recently. Maybe they lost a job recently, but that describes literally hundreds of thousands of people in the United States. So you can't just look for those particular features and say, aha, this person's about to commit a mass shooting. There is this unfortunate randomness about mass shootings that you just, you would love to have a little mass shooting detector where you could just move it around and find the properties that, that predict a mass shooting, but they, there just are none. And that's very distressing. I don't know if that responds to your point, but that was just some, some thoughts that occurred. So would you support sort of a hybrid gun control account? So, okay, state still allows you to own guns or doesn't get in the way of you owning a gun, but they make it a little bit more difficult. So in order to buy an automatic weapon, you've got to pass certain tests. In order to buy a gun, there's sort of a cooling off period. So you can't pick one up the same day. You've got to apply for a license and it takes some time. Perhaps there's restrictions on who can purchase guns at all. So there's licensing uh, requirements. Perhaps you might have to have undergone some sort of capability check or some mental health check. I imagine you're going to have some objections to each of these, or at least I can imagine certain people having objections to each of these. It sounds like this would be one way to still allow guns in a society and and not live in this utopian dream of saying we could wave the magic wand and make them all disappear, but at the same time trying to reduce the likelihood of mass casualty events. Yeah, so that there are some some ways of restricting guns to some people that gun advocates are totally fine with. I'll mention a few of them. There are some that, of course, they're not fine with. But here's here's some that uh, they're totally fine with, which is banning high risk individuals from having guns. So like convicted felons, or, or at least people convicted of a violent crime, um, or stalking, or people who have a restraining order against them. Then of course most people are like, yeah, of course that person shouldn't have a gun. If they've shown, if they have a, a long history of criminal activity, even if it's not violent crime, you, if it's long enough, you might think that those persons should be denied. Uh, gun right. They've had plenty of chances to sort of like preserve their right to own a gun and they just refuse to to sort of get their act straight. Um, i trying to think if there's any other ones. I mean, um, maybe one that a lot of people like is closing the, the gun show loophole. So in the United States, if you buy from a gun store, you have to undergo a background check and those are pretty effective. But if you buy a gun at a gun show, then you don't have to undergo a background check. And so uh, a lot of people think, look, that's, that's just a clear case where we can, a clear place where we can make some progress. That is, we just make sure this person isn't a criminal. Even gun advocates are like, that's fine. So those are two that strike me as roughly right. I mean, here's some other suggestions that, that gun advocates have that's not necessarily related to guns, which is a lot of gun deaths in the United States and homicides are due to drug wars. So or, or at least sort of interactions between people in, in drug rings. And so one concern you might have is, well, maybe we should go easy on the drug war. And the reason that people who are, who are trafficking drugs begin to fight each other is because what they're doing is trafficking things that are illegal. So when they have disputes, they can't go to the courts to get them resolved. Instead, they have to resolve them themselves. And so they do that with guns. So if these drugs were legal, then they could go to courts to get their, their disputes resolved and they wouldn't have to resort to gun violence. Another thing is mental health services. So it, a lot, as I said, about two thirds of gun deaths are are suicides. These people need mental health aid in some way or other. So perhaps diverting um, resources from gun control policies or gun control enforcement to mental health services would be a good way to go. These are all ways that you could try to reduce the gun deaths without significantly restricting people's gun rights. I think gun advocates are happy to go with those. As far as anything more extensive, I think gun rights advocates are not big fans. So for instance, a lot of people think you should ban high magazine or high round magazines. So magazines of 10 or more uh, rounds you should ban. But of course, most gun advocates say, no, actually, we're going to need those if multiple people want to come after us or if the government wants to turn on us or if we get invaded or those sorts of things, we're going to need those. Now, maybe like a hundred round magazine, maybe you don't need that or something like that. But even then, it sounds like you're going to need a hundred round magazine for, for tyranny purposes. So those are just some things that I think gun advocates would be willing to meet gun control uh, advocates halfway on, but past that, probably not much else. Yeah, so I like your strategy of saying if you care about reducing suffering, there are a bunch of well thought out measures you could do that would reduce suffering. And one of them, as you say, is you could legalize all drugs, for example. You could take the right. Portuguese model and say, we're not just going to legalize marijuana, we're going to legalize heroin and cocaine and all of it. And you'll find that then when people find themselves in disputes over non payment, 
they can go and see arbitrators or court officials and they can resolve that stuff non-violently. I mean, what's interesting is from what I gather that criminal organizations have their own informal arbitration networks uh, because they realize it's not good to be in a war with each other. You end up losing a bunch of employees. They're ultimately businessmen. And at some point, if you can't reach a private agreement, well, then the unfortunate thing is you have to start using violence. And so you might think that being able to remove the option of violence by having legitimate ways of resolving disputes would be a very good idea. There's another yeah. sense in which guns might be incredibly useful, which is that if you care about gender-based violence, if you're worried about women being raped and murdered and beaten by their husbands, who are often going to be all strangers who are stronger than them, men tend to be a lot stronger than women on average. One way to um, reduce that power imbalance is to ensure that women have guns. There's a case in South Africa of a grandmother and her grandchild driving around the center of town. And a guy came up to their vehicle and tried to steal the vehicle from them and pose a threat to their lives. And the grandmother very quickly took out her handgun from her handbag and shot the guy in the head and saved her life and saved her, her, her grandchild's life. So there's a sense in which the little old lady, you might not want to pick on her if you think she might be carrying a gun. That's right. Yeah. So gun advocates call a gun this is the great equalizer because it doesn't, you don't have to be some big, large, scary person. You don't have to take jujitsu classes. You don't have to know any special holds or anything like that. Uh, you just know how you have to know how to pull a trigger. And of course, who stands to gain from a, a regime in which there's this sort of equalization? It's the weak. So in a in a situation in which the the strong are dominating the weak, if you have something that could sort of lower the power that the strong have and increase the power that the weak have, then you're going to put the worst off in society in significantly better position than they otherwise would be. And that's an excellent reason to, yeah, to have at least privately gun, private gun ownership, at least being legal for people. Another thing about, just to go back to the gun war really quickly, one thing you can't miss when you're looking at murder rates in the, in, across the world is that the top 10 or 15 or so are in uh, North America. And then, and then it moved down, to, sorry, are in North or South America. So that suggests that um, there's something about the going on in the Americas that's explaining this. My suggest, my my suspect, or, or my suspicion is that it is it's the drug war in the United States that it's because these guns are useful for getting drugs from one place to another in the United States, and that explains why their murder rates are so high. Okay, so at, at the beginning of this, this discussion, I said to you, I'm kind of on the, on the fence about this. And it just sounds like your case is a little bit, your argument's a bit too convincing. So I, I just, I need to push back a little bit. I mean, I have been trying, but but I feel unsuccessfully. Okay, so we're trying to not wave a magic wand, but decide where our budget's going to go. And perhaps here's one suggestion, right? So we don't outlaw guns necessarily, but we, through various measures, make it very tough to own a gun. And we disincentivize people from owning guns and strongly push people to hand them in. Perhaps don't force them, but strongly push. Perhaps you have a buyback scheme, whatever it is. At the same time, we massively increase our policing. Now, there's an experiment that was done here in South Africa, which we, we have a, a crime-ridden society. But I was involved in an analysis just before our Soccer World Cup. So... We, we were involved in the analysis of gun statistics and gun-related deaths in South Africa. And what was found was that when they massively increased police presence during the Soccer World Cup here in South Africa, the, the number of gun-related deaths and gun-related incidents massively decreased, even though the number of guns were the same. So perhaps the argument goes, well, yes, you're arguing that guns are required for self-defense, but perhaps there's other measures that we could take rather than giving people guns or letting them own guns. Perhaps there's other measures we could take, like massively increasing policing. Yeah, I think this is the right way to go. That is, think of ways besides just taking away people's guns that could help make this work. And one thing is, I think this is one of the best established results in the social science of crime, which is the more police officers in an area, the less crime that you have in that area. And it seems intuitively Correct. Like it, it sort of passes the smell test. So yeah, that's another thing that you could do. Unfortunately, it's always going to be the case that the police just can't be everywhere. They're not omnipresent. And so there's still the, 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 the chance that you could be killed. And if you are sort of convinced by the idea that you have a right to defend yourself against unjust attack, then even if there are lots of police everywhere and they're doing a great job of bringing crime down, you might think that's not going to be a good enough reason to restrict or at least significantly restrict gun access. Now, maybe that's not what you were suggesting. Maybe you're just suggesting look, maybe you should do all of these things. And I think that's absolutely right. I think that's the right way to think about this. What are some other things that we can do to minimize the gun deaths rather than taking away guns? I suggested something like ending the, the war on drugs or helping people with their mental health to pull down the suicidal 
the suicide uh, rates. Uh, I think that would do, I, I mean, we have, we don't really know how significant that would be, but it seems like it would do a pretty good job if you just begin looking at where the, the murders and the, and the homicides and the gun deaths are coming from. It gives you a good indication of, of how that would go. So I like the idea of ramping up the amount of policing. Now, of course, there's tons of suspicion about police in the United States, whether that's justified or not is an interesting question, but it certainly would, if, if what you're interested in is reducing gun deaths, almost certainly that would do the job. Yeah, so let's talk about that suspicion about the police. It seems that a number of people are suspicious about the police, and sometimes for good reason. I mean, America went through months uh, of violent protests because of the killing of George Floyd at the hands of the police, notably not in a shooting, not even with a weapon. You have a situation where the, the police officer murdered George Floyd by putting his knee on his neck. Now, the core at the time, and a lot of people really, you know, took hold of the idea was that we should abolish the police or massively defund them. And in some places, I gather this is what happened. So police departments were strangled to funds. And as you point out, what happens is that those neighborhoods that have less police have more violent crime. So gangsters looked at this and said, well, the chances of me getting apprehended by a police officer are very low, given that we've now abolished them or defunded them. And they're going to be a lot less likely to use any force against me because I've got a camera in my pocket and uh, it might look very bad for them. But again, if we veer into the kind of political or aesthetic territory and we're not just you know thinking about the numbers and there's an excellent um, episode of Sam Harris's show where he does this cold breakdown of, of police killings in the States and points out how incredibly rare they are, but how they become very vivid because everybody has a camera in their pocket. And so whenever one happens, we're painfully aware of it. So is there an argument for saying, well, given the kinds of societal implications we can have from these police encounters with citizens, that we should just try and scrap the whole thing. Let's abolish the police. You know, let's just you know, limit as much power as possible. Then we won't have these awful videos of police um, shooting people and strangling them to death. Yeah, this is a good example of why it's so important to sort of uh, think carefully about about the the sort of second and third steps along uh, some policy suggestion because it sounds great. I mean, it, it's no there's just no doubt that the police overstepped their their authority many times, leading to tons of injustices. No doubt about it. And so it does sound like the right thing to do is just ban the police or abolish the police or at least significantly defund them. Unfortunately, yeah, I think many people who thought that was a good idea in 2020 are seeing that it was less of a good idea and are reversing their policies. And that's, I mean, it, it's it's sort of like, I'm okay with the sort of having experiments and living. So like, I guess I'm glad that we tried it out so we could see like, apparently that doesn't work. So I'm all for experiments and thinking about how to do this stuff. I think if other people want to try it, let them try. No problem. As long as it's sort of a voluntary scheme or whatever. But for the most part, my suspicion is that it's not going to work. And it's not going to work precisely because criminals know that, look, if there's less enforcement around here, it's easier for me to do the kinds of things that I want to do, which is steal people's stuff and harm people and force them to do things and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, I think it's a good idea in theory, but uh, less good in practice. And that happens to be the case, I think, with lots of gun control policies, which is it makes perfect sense why you do that. It, it's a totally intuitive idea that you would ban guns because look at all the murders in America. But if you think two and three and four steps down the road, you'll see that not as good as it sounds at first. So yeah, I mean, this is generally right when you need to look at public policy. You've got to look at the unintended consequences of intentional action. And so many people just don't do that. A policy makes sense on its face and they just don't, as you say, look two or three or four steps down the road. What do you think the best argument is in favor of gun control? I really like this one from Jeff McMahon. So there's two ways to understand it. The one is that it's a, that what we've got in America is a prisoner's, is a, is a society-wide prisoner's dilemma. And with any prisoner's dilemma, what you've got is some behavior that's individually advantageous, but collectively harmful. And that's what it is when you get a gun. A lot of people think, ah, I'm better off as a result of having this gun. So it's individually advantageous. But when everybody reasons that way and gets themselves a gun, now we have 400 million guns in the United States and everyone is worse off as a result, at least as Jeff McMahon pitches it. And so what do you do in the face of prisoners' dilemmas? What you have to do is you have to ban the individually or at least incentivize in some way or other, often bans do this, disincentivize the individually collective or individually advantageous but collectively harmful behavior. That is, you got to ban the guns. This is why you got to ban overfishing or at least significantly regulate overfishing because it's individually advantageous to overfish, but where it's collectively harmful to do that. So that's uh, his argument for the gun ban. Another way of pitching his argument is that, oh, look, you guys think that self-defense is the reason that we ought to uh, have private gun ownership. Well, guess what? The best way to protect you from unjust attack 
um, is to ban the guns. That is, if what you're worried about is bodily security, that's why you need to have the right to defend yourself. Your bodily security is best secured by a gun ban. Unfortunately, I think the problem with that, I think that's the best argument there is. You guys are worried about your bodily security. We can do it with a gun ban. Unfortunately, I think just empirically that's false. That is because when you ban guns, you take them away from the compliant, give it to the non-compliant, and then you're not significantly better off, at least not the people that you are trying to protect, which is people who are going to be unjustly attacked. So some of the legal work that I do in South Africa revolves around quite brutal cases of home invasions. We have a severe amount of it in South Africa, and it's not just people coming in and robbing and killing. There's uh, often very brutal torture attached to it. So I recently ran a trial where I spoke to people that survived these attacks and spoke to a counseling psychologist who'd spend time with over 100 people who'd survived these attacks. And you find people are, drills are put through their knees, people are covered in molten plastic, um, bottles are broken and used to mutilate their genitals, they are raped. And it seems that one way to deter the attackers might be to have to have guns. So in other words, the sense that the attacker comes in, you would be able to fend off the attack. But I wonder about the kinds of guns that you use and how far it is up the scale that you can use for deterrence. So there are certain kinds of bullets, for example, that are going to cause immense amounts of suffering and certain kinds of bullets that are banned. And if what we want to use guns for is to either deter home invaders or going to use, you know, terrible means like torch that I've described or the tyranny of the state, would you want to place any kinds of restrictions on what means they can use to prevent the attack, as I say, or to treat people in a way that they deserve to say, well, if you're going to torture us, then we're going to torture you with our weapons too. Yeah. From a legal point of view, I probably wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to prevent any sort of especially painful ways of deterring people. But just when it comes to the ethics of that sort of thing, typically the thought is when you're using self-defensive force, you should use what's necessary and no more then you need to avert the the threat, whatever that is. So if it were me and I were going to choose the bullets, the ones that's going to put a huge hole in the back of you or just like stop you from harming me, I'd probably choose the ones that are just going to stop you from harming me. But then I'm a little unsure about that. So I don't know if I want the state sort of making that call. Well, we're going to give you only the ones that will deter people and not be especially painful for people. So but as far as the moral question goes, I think you should probably use whatever is necessary to avert the attack to you and not punish and like add an extra oomph to it. To it. But from a legal point of view, I think you should probably let people buy what they what they want to buy and let them deal with the morality of it all. If I could mention just one comment, I mean, I'm sure there's we're in large agreement about, or at least it sounds like it, about this issue. And the state of philosophy is such that most people are in a state of agreement that gun control is obviously what we should do. Extensive gun control, maybe even gun bans. And I mean, one reason that might be is because I sit here in the, the United States and in in especially, uh, or at least more dangerous city. So Memphis, Tennessee has a pretty high um, murder rate and you guys are in South Africa, but lots of people, I just want to point out, are in relative, relatively safe places. So they're, they sort of just can't understand why would anybody need a gun? And one thing that a lot of gun advocates like to point out is, well, yeah, because you're upper middle class and you can afford to live in a place where there's not much gun violence and you can afford to be among people who are very nice to you. And so your coworkers are typically ap- academics who aren't especially violent people. You probably have a high IQ. So you have stable relationships where people aren't mad at you all the time. You don't have family members who are coming to hurt you. You uh, don't have significant others who are coming to hurt you. But there's a huge segment of the people in this world for whom that is not true. And they have people who are coming to kill them. They can't choose to live wherever they want. They have to live in dangerous cities because there's dangerous parts of cities because that's all they can afford to do. And those people need protection. And the fact that you can't see that because, you know, what, nobody's coming after me. Well, yeah, they're not coming after you. They're coming after other people. And those are the people that you should worry about if you're thinking about this, not just people in relative comfort like academics. To add to that idea, I mean, both of us live in societies where we don't just have high levels of policing. We also have high levels of private security and those private security guards carry guns. And so it's very easy to say, we don't need private guns when you've outsourced it to someone else who you pay who carries a gun on your behalf. And I think if the idea was to say, okay, well, in addition to taking away your private gun, none of these private security guys can carry guns either, and we're just going to see what happens, then I think some of those uh, people living in cushy neighborhoods might start to feel a little less comfortable. 